Okay. All right. So uh, welcome everyone and welcome back. Uh, hope you had a chance to stretch your legs a little bit and get your coffee and now ready for this session. So we are now in session four where we will hear two very interesting talks covering different aspects or application of, of artificial intelligence in carbon needs. And I'm sure that all of us here are really excited to hear about this. But before we start, let me quickly remind you that for the presenters, you have 12 minutes to present your talk and to make sure that you're on time, we'll give you a two minute warning. After that, we'll have seven minutes for questions. So if you have any questions, please type your question in the chat and make sure to send it to everyone. Uh, lastly, any form of recording is not allowed during this entire session. Um, so I guess that's all. And to respect everybody's time, uh, let's start our session. So our first speaker today is Isaac Jayachandran from Texas a &M, and he will be sharing uh, his study on evaluating microcrystal segmentation algorithms. So go ahead, Isaac. Uh, the floor is yours whenever you're ready. Uh, all right. Can you all hear me? All right. One sec. Is everyone there? Is yeah. yeah, we can hear you. We can, we can see you. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Let me just start the slideshow. All right. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank BSRG for this opportunity to present my work. Um, this is not a solo effort, so I'd like to thank all the people that I've mentioned that are written on my slide over there for this. Um, I want to give a special mention to Holly Gibbs because she's actually a biologist. So a lot of the biology influence you're going to see in this talk, right? So I'm going to talk about evaluating microcrystal segmentation algorithms. And uh, basically, I know it sounds like a mouthful, but then I promise you by the end of this, not only will you know what it is, you'll also be able to use these algorithms because they're quite simple. So you can do it right after the talk even. <laughs> All right, so my talks are going to be clean and simple. I'm going to give a quick and dirty overview of microcrystals. I'm going to then jump into the meat, which is uh, segmentation. And then I'm going to go over, uh, finish off with how we evaluate the accuracy of the segmentation. And I'll close off from there. So starting off, what are microcrystals? Well, uh, this is an incredibly loaded and ongoing question. But for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to go with the cosmetic definition, which is basically these low mac calcite crystals, which are less than 10 microns in size and host pores less than 10 microns. So the scope here is low mac calcite microcrystals. And as you can see in this SEM rock chip image, the main thing we really focus on is the morphology, the mainly the size, the shape, and the contact type. So why are they important? Well, initially in geology, it was the reasons for studying it was wholly in geological. So they looked at it to try to understand the depositional narrative or how did the processes seen in the morphology affect the biogenetic narrative and so on and so forth. But then I guess at some point, okay, uh, it started becoming clear that these crystals, these sort of chalky beds are actually major reservoirs. And I think it wasn't too long until studies linking crystal morphology uh, to porosity and permeability came along. So as you can see over here, they're uh, linking morphology to por poroperm. It also, they've been linking it to petrophysics and so on and so forth. <clears throat> so there's a lot of interest in that. But the thing is, carbonates being carbonates, we don't really know how much of it is actually, uh, how much is interparticle micropore dominated. So I guess LMI is probably changing the game there because it's showing us actually through SEM how much of the matrix is actually key. And any porosity in the matrix is generally affected by the microcrystal morphology. What are the existing solutions in the geosciences? Well, starting off, you've got pure visual observations. This is kind of problematic because it's purely qualitative, but it's the go-to right now in the geoscience. The second thing is manual point measurements. So, I mean, if you can just think about the approach applied there, it's incredibly time consuming. You cannot repeat it. It's not reproducible and it's extremely difficult to verify. So honestly, this is not really a viable approach. People, so um, image analysis is generally the way to go and people have applied it, but not for the crystal run. They've been looking at it from the scale of say, pores instead. Sorry, just need to raise this one from pores instead. So basically I understood that geology doesn't have any great solutions. So I had to look at bioimaging instead who deal with SEM images of more complexity and they're still succeeding. So this project is about testing several different bioimaging segmentation algorithms and evaluating the accuracy. 
And this is the guidelines which I use. So it should be repeatable, reproducible, efficient, open source, so the science can advance, easy to use because we're all kind of learning tech, you know. All right, segmentation. What is segmentation? Well, if I can just direct your uh, eyes to the image on the left, we can see the crystals and we can see some pores because our brains are very good segmentation machines. But the machine actually sees this. It's just a bunch of pixels with numbers. So the process of getting the computer to go from there to see crystals as connected group of, of pixels, that is segmentation in a nutshell. And that's what I'm gonna be testing. This is my entire project on, on a page. So we start off with an image and this is a typical digital image analysis workflow. I'm gonna be focusing on the segmentation here. So, and on how we evaluate it, not so much on the application. In terms of the programs that the algorithms that we're running, it goes from the simplest as global thresholding and so on, goes to more complex, which is machine learning. Deep learning is not considered here because as Harriet Dawson will speak afterwards, the data set we need for that is huge and it's not right now what's happening. So moving on. I have a total of 378 images so far that we've built, it's still building up, they're all public domain. Nearly 40% was donated by BSRG, so thank you so much for all that. However, for this talk, I'm only gonna be using 11 images to show, and these are some examples of some of the images that I have, and we're using the Kazmarek et al. 2015 classification system. Okay, so right off the bat, I need to select a region of interest, the ROI. So this is actually an image from James Buckman. So I chose a small 512 by 512 pixel zone because it makes it easier for manual annotation uh, later on, which I will touch on. So this image that you see on the top is the image which I'm gonna be constructing the rest of the narrative on. Pre-processing is essential because a lot of these algorithms depend strongly on the noise. And as you can see the original on the left, you apply some denoising, some non-local means, you enhance the contrast because you wanna see the crystals, you wanna see the pores separate as you can. Okay, so the first and the oldest method in the playbook is global thresholding. Uh, it's also the worst method because if you can look here on the bottom, this particular form of images has unimodal distributions. So if you're gonna try to split that, you're gonna end up with very, very gangly crystals which are completely connected and there is no clear what's crystal, what's poor really. So in the end, we basically just have to discard this method. It's very sensitive to noise as well. And uh, yeah, and so on and so forth. So the rest is actually better to be used. Edge detection is, it works on a different basis. So if I can just direct the image to the bottom left image, you can see that at areas where the intensity changes is big. So in the case where a crystal boundary goes to the pore, you would, the filter will pick up on that, very, on that uh, shift. And so it'll give you images which look like this. Now this image is well and nice, but the diff the problem is it cannot differentiate between pores and crystals. There's only the edges. So in the end, you end up with images which look like all crystals. So you're not really doing a good job there. And also if the problem is very sensitive to noise, just like global thresholding, but it can be useful in situations like this where you don't see pores, but you only see crystals and edges. It could be, and I'll show you later on the accuracy values where we landed. The third one is basically a Fiji plugin, which is called uh, Interactive H Watershed. By the way, before I forget, all these algorithms that I've mentioned are all open source Fiji plugins. It's very simple to run. Uh, yeah, so basically watershed works on like, what you see here is on a catchment basins and dam principle. So either the brightest part of the image will be the basin or the darkest part, either way. It'll basically, the program fills it with pixels and when pixels from different basins merge, that's when we'll basically put a dam there and close it. So if you can see in this image, the crystals there seem to be closed off pretty well. It's captured some areas very well, as you can see in the final image, but however, it's also done some under segmentation as you can see here where it's taken many crystals as one. It's also done over segmentation where it's taken a single crystal, split it up into several others. So this is why we need the evaluation protocol in the end. This was actually developed by biologists as well, this plugin. The last one is trainable Weka segmentation. It is a machine learning algorithm, uh, super simple to use. It's a Fiji plugin. And you can look over here. I just, all I had to do was train the crystal, train the program on what is crystal, what is the pore, and what is the contacts in the situation. And then you keep supervising the results and train it. And you eventually end up with what you get like two possible outputs, like the classified image, what you see on top. 
the crystal probability map, which you see at the bottom. And the thing is, both of them kind of give similar results after binarizing. So we're still trying to see if there's anything, any diff significant difference, but at least from what I see, both outputs seem to give us pretty good results. And if you see the pores and the crystals are clearly delineated. The final stage, which is evaluation. So I'm gonna direct, you, direct your eyes to this. Uh, stand, manual annotation is the only way to truly test. That is the gold standard. But obviously I'm not just gonna take one manual annotation and say, hey, that's the gold standard because I may be subjective. So the thing is what we are planning to do is we take three experts and we average out their annotations and then, even, and then eventually you end up with what you get the gold standard annotation. You then apply automated segmentation evaluation protocols and it will give you values on how accurate these values are. Uh, there are two stages to this. There's a one which is a simple segmentation evaluation, which is basically, uh, you just basically overlap your ground truth and your segmented image. So in this case, the green is my ground truth, the, the red is my segmented image. I add them up, I merge them, and then eventually yellow means it's perfectly overlapped. Black means it's perfectly overlapped in the negative domain. But green means there is the ground truth hasn't been matched by the image, by the segmented image, and the red means the, the computer has done something extra. So as you can see right here, there's clearly like, oh, sorry. You have two more minutes. Yeah, there's clearly a difference, a mismatch in terms of, you know, the visual, in terms of the ground truth, which is the green and the red, where the segmentation, it over segmented like over here, as I showed you earlier. But, the th but even then it gives pretty high values like 87%, 77% accuracy values, which is actually rosy projections. And this is not actually really correct because it just puts the pixels on top of each other and says, hey, this is, uh, as long as the white pixels match with the white and the black pixels match with the black. What we need is where the individual crystals themselves are course, the corresponding individual crystals are matched with each other. And then if you connect that, that's the real way. So for the, uh, not able to go to the next slide. All right, cool. Uh, now this slide looks a little busy and looks ex looks a little extra, but basically we use this thing called the Jacquard similarity matrix. This is a macro which is developed, uh, which is adapted by my uh, collaborator, Holly. And uh, basically what this does is it creates a sort of heat map and uh, heat map for the crystals so that it will match them by similarity. There is a better slide which explains this better, but since of time constraints, I'll just go ahead and just say this is, connects the pairs very well. <laughs> All right, this is the last, uh, this is the end of it. So basically this, the empty bars are the simple segmentation values and the full, the filled bars are the actual, uh, the pairwise segmentation values. Green is edge detection, orange is, uh, orange is uh, watershed and blue is uh, weka. Basically, Edge detection as a whole seems to suffer throughout. It's very poor, but edge detection and Weka seem to be pretty strong throughout. And in edge detection even seems to outmatch Weka in several situations. So machine learning doesn't necessarily have to be the solution. These are like the 11 images which I used. And however, it's too early to draw conclusions as we still need to process the larger image data set. Closing remarks, um, I, there are limitations to this approach because we are converting 3D images to 2D features. The crystals and pores are apparent in nature because it's not true. You There is a lot of overlap and things like that. Global thresholding edge detection falls apart in most situations and are highly dependent on pre-processing parameters. However, we believe in terms of contributions, uh, this sort of increases the awareness for algorithms to analyze this particular niche form of images and it's from bioimaging. Interactive H watershed and Weka can potentially become mainstays in this. And Weka is especially sensitive is robust against noise. And we've also provided a proven segmentation evaluation protocol for rock chip SEM images. I would like to uh, acknowledge the BSRG and the individual authors for the image donations. Special thanks to Dr. Stephen Lokio for encouraging me to present here and Dr. Kathy Hollis for encouraging feedback throughout this project and ongoing. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks Isaac, a great talk, very interesting. So uh, let me see my, from the chat. So we have one question from Fiona. So thanks Isaac for your talk. Have you, have people used the same sort of thresholding for 3D images like CT scans? Yes, people have used uh, thresholding for CT scans. 
Uh, however, that is on the pore domain, not on the crystal domain. Uh, what I'm proposing here is purely on the crystal domain. And, uh, and this is purely on rock chip SEM images because this is the only place where you can see the 3D nature of the crystals. So, I don't see any other questions coming in. Um, I have a quick question for you. Um, sure. Uh, do you think, you know, do you consider like merging these different uh, methods like, you know, edge detection with the thresholding that you use with even with machine learning all together to, to create a more yes. robust segmentation in the future? Exactly. So that is something that's definitely next phase at the moment, because at, at the moment we wanted to see on a high level what can give us the closest segmentation result before we start mixing and matching. Because when we do that, we're going to have to control the parameters at each level. So it adds complexity. And it's definitely something for the future. Like at the moment, it's just a high level segmentation. And we want to make sure that we control the variables here. And once we know what works, what doesn't, depending on the noise profile, we can definitely start mixing and matching, create an all-in-one solution. Because these are all biology, you know? So we want right. something for geology. So. <laughs> Cool. Um, so we have another question from uh, Pete Bridges here. So really interesting talk. Thank you. Uh, how big does the data set need to be before the machine learning methods will work? Uh, machine learning, you can. It doesn't matter. You can take your single image, put it in Weka. You can go. You don't need to train it on a in a on a training data set. But deep learning, on the other hand, I'm sure RD and Harriet will agree. You need to manually annotate a large training data set. And uh, we actually have a big image repository, which we are breaking into small, small sections, and we're going to manually annotate them and potentially create a public library, uh, which people can use for deep learning. But at the moment, it's not happening because it's too difficult. <laughs> okay, so we have another question coming in from uh, Huang. So very interesting talk. Um, sorry, let me scroll up a little bit. My question is about the slide with ground truth and segmentation. Could you please explain more details what is the segmentation did exactly in that case? I don't I don't see really I don't really see the big difference. Over here? Yeah. So this is my ground truth, right? So the thing is exactly. So if you don't see much of difference, it's good news. But you know, the thing is over here you can see some in the green channel, basically you can see where I ground truthed it and the computer didn't pick it up. So it definitely didn't pick up all the crystals. It picked up some. And it even added its own crystals. You can see in the red where it's over segmented, you know? So this is purely a visual comparison. This is not accurate because if you're gonna just do pixel overlap, it's not good. You need object overlap, which is what we proposed here, where you take similar crystals and put them together. Okay, so another question from Harriet. So I know you said you're choosing not to approach deep learning due to data set size. Have you considered using transfer learning with an existing algorithm? I know some great segmentation models have been developed from UNET such as ISNET from the BAS. Yes, actually we were thinking about transfer learning, uh, but however, the we still need to manually annotate several, at least, at least, I mean, from what I, from what I believe, uh, at least, uh, 200 or 100 and 200 images and thing is we've got logistical issues with a lot of annotations. We are thinking of crowdsourcing as an option because my wife and mother both think it's a very farming activity. So, you know, that is definitely on the cards, but at the moment, no, but deep learning would be the way to go. And we have the data set. So hopefully one day. Um, just another one from Pete Bridges. So just to be clear, the deep learning method only works with manual training input. That's not kind of defeat the purpose? Uh, yeah, no, the thing is once you do deep learning, like if you manually annotate say like a data set of so and so much and so forth, then the program kind of knows it and then you can run it on millions of images. You could even batch process it at that point. You don't, it saves time in the long run. Like, yeah. I mean, I'm sure RD would be better suited for that. I'm not a deep learning expert. <laughs> okay, so do you still have time for I think we should probably move on, actually. Um, okay. I think Switch it over to you then, Kathy. Yeah, yeah. No, I just run over slightly, but thank you, Isaac. That was great. Um, okay, so our second talk is Harriet Dawson. Um, follow on um, nicely from, from that. Uh, and she's going to talk about CNN architectures for carbonate core classification.
Harriet, if you can share, I'll hand over to you. Sorry. Um, can you can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. <laughs> Sorry. So I couldn't work out whether you started speaking up. Okay. Yeah, I think I was pressing too many buttons at once. Uh, can you see my screen okay? Um, cool. Okay. Um, so hi, I'm Harriet. I'm a second year PhD student at uh, the Carbonate Research Group in Imperial College London. Today I'm going to be discussing some of our latest work, which is a comparison of convolutional neural networks for carbonate core classification. Um, so many modern geological practices in both industry and in academia rely largely on a legacy of observational data at a range of scales. However, there are widespread ambiguities in the petrographic description of rock fasces, and this can reduce the reliability of descriptive data. The modified Dunham classification, which you can see on the right of the slide, is acknowledged as one of the most commonly used classification schemes for the description of carbonate rocks. I'm sure as carbonate geologists, you're all fairly familiar with this scheme and have probably used it at some point in your careers. However, recent studies have shown that even with the well-established and clearly defined divisions of the scheme, experienced sedimentologists will often classify the same fasces using different textual names. So what can we do about that? Um, recently, deep learning, specifically convolutional neural networks, have achieved pretty extraordinary results in many applications, including image classification. And we can see from this that there's great potential for the use of machine learning in carbonate classification from digital images. So I guess, the goal of this project is ultimately to develop a classifier framework that can reliably extract it, um, information from rock images, which will then allow for more accurate and uniform fasces descriptions, faster analysis times and reduction of natural biases. So for the past year or so, I've been investigating the ability of machine learning, specifically those deep neural networks, to classify carbonate rock fasces according to the textual Dunham classification scheme. So how have I done that? Well, I've been using a machine learning method called transfer learning. Now, I don't know how many machine learning enthusiasts we currently have watching um, or how familiar you may be with it all. So I'm just going to give you a quick whistle stop introduction to transfer learning and how we're applying this technique to the world of carbonates. OK, so let's start with an understanding of what transfer learning is. Um, we as humans have an ability to transfer knowledge across tasks. What we acquire as knowledge while learning about one task, we can use in the same way to solve related tasks. So the more related those tasks are, the easier it is for us to transfer our knowledge. Um, for example, if you know how to drive a car, you could learn to drive a van. In these scenarios, when we attempt to learn new things, we don't learn everything from scratch. We transfer our knowledge from what we've learned in the past. And that's kind of the whole idea behind transfer learning. Rather than creating a new model for each different data set, we take a pre-trained model that's been developed for one task and we reuse it as the starting point for a model on a second similar task. This is also particularly useful for reducing resource intensive training times and for tasks where limited training data are available, which is really common in geology. So how can we use this for image classification? Luckily for us, a range of high performing models have been developed for image classification. And this is demonstrated on the annual ImageNet Large Scale Visual Recognition Challenge. It's quite a mouthful. <laughs> um, these models have learned how to detect generic features from images. Um, so they were trained on more than 1,000 images um, for uh, 1 million images for 1,000 categories. And um, so that's everything from golden retrievers to ice cream to toilet paper. So taking this idea of transfer learning, we can use the representations learned by one of these networks to extract meaningful features from a new data set. We don't need to retrain the entire model as the base convolutional network already contains features that are generically useful for classifying images. However, the final classification part of the pre-trained model is specific to the original classification task and subsequently specific to the set of classes on which the model was originally trained. So we need to change those final layers and add a new classifier, which will then be trained from scratch on our own data set. So that's kind of great. Um, but the challenge started back in 2010. And since then, quite a few different models have been developed. So which architecture is best? Well, you might think that the most recent winner of the, um, the most recent challenge or the model with the highest accuracy overall would be the best model to use. 
but it's not quite that simple. If you look in the literature, transfer learning for image classification is being used for a wide range of applications. This is everything from plant disease detection in tomato leaves to traffic sign identification for autonomous vehicles, even COVID-19 detection in chest radiographs. But each of these applications uses a different model. So it still remains to be determined which of the available networks designed for and trained on image nets will perform best for a geological classification task. So we have systematically investigated the performance of nine different openly available CNNs on four different architectures on a data set of carbonate core images. So the data set for this work has been created using high resolution core images from the upper to distal carbonate slope transects that were drilled during ODP leg 133 and ODP leg 194 in the carbonate platforms and troughs of the northeastern Australia, um, as well as the platform carbonates drilled during IODP expedition 359 in the Maldives archipelago. So these core images, you can see they're in color, so that means they're stored as three dimensional matrices with red, green and blue layers. Um, the scans of a 1.5 meter section are approximately 31,600 pixels by 1,750 pixels. So this means that these individual images can provide some of the highest resolution examples of core uh, properties available at present. In order to retain that resolution, we cropped or sliced the images according to the network input size. And this created um, a data set containing 104,306 images across seven classes from the modified Dunham classification. Finally, we split this data into three sets, uh, so a training set containing 60% of the images and a validation set and a test set that both contain 20% of the images. Um, so the architectures selected for this comparison were VGG, Inception V3, ResNet and DenseNet. We trained nine different convolutional ne neural networks of these four different architectures on the data set, um, and we did all of this in Pyth uh, using Python in the TensorFlow library. So although the ImageNet challenge showed a trend towards higher accuracies through increasing the number of layers in a CNN, we're interested in seeing if this is necessary for a geological classification task. Um, like I said earlier, the ImageNet challenge includes 1,000 possible categories per image, but our data set of carbonate cores only distinguishes between seven classes. So our sort of working hypothesis for this is that the depth of a network may not necessarily be decisive for good performance on geological data. A CNN with fewer layers might perform similarly to a deeper, more complex networks, while at the same time requiring less computational resources and less training time. As part of the model training, we also decided to add an additional fine tuning step. Um, so this is an optional last step that can potentially increase performance further. Once the model um, is converged on the new data, we unfroze the parts of the base model and fine tuned a small number of top layers and retrain the model end to end with a very low running rate. In most convolutional networks, the higher up a layer is, the more specialized it is. The first few layers learn very simple and generic features that generalize to most types of images. These features then become increasingly more specific to the data set on which the model was originally trained as you go higher up through the layers. So the goal of fine tuning is to adapt these specialized features to work with our own data set rather than overwriting those generic um, learnings. To allow a fair comparison between the experiments, we attempted to standardize the hyperparameters across the experiments. So you can see the CNN settings we chose um, here on this slide. Um, so to the results. Um, so this work is kind of intended as a guide for anyone who's wanting to produce an image classification model in the geosciences. And ultimately, when we're creating machine learning models, we're really interested in the real world applications of this research. So when we're doing deep learning, how good our models predictions are isn't the only consideration that we need to be aware of. We need to start thinking about things like the amount of space the model takes up, the amount of memory it uses at runtime, and how fast the model runs. Um, so here on this graph here, we've got um, accuracy, computational complexity, and model complexity. Um, so the size of the circles is proportional to the number of trainable parameters. Remember, some of our lower layers are frozen, so there are some non-trainable parameters. Um, and our x-axis, we have the number of floating point operations or flops. Um, if you don't know what that is, it's basically a rough measure of computational complexity. So ideally we want to find a good trade-off between complexity and accuracy. And actually here we see that an increase in computational complexity will not necessarily translate into a proportional increase in recognition performance. In the ResNet architecture, we do see an increase in accuracy with increasing complexity. Um, so those are the, the green dots. 
Um, but actually the highest accuracies were obtained by DenseNet 169, so that's 71.22%, and Inception V3, which is 71.14%. And these show comp comparatively lower complexities. Um, just a little note on VGG down in the corner, um, even though it has much fewer layers than the other networks, it works on much larger feature naps, um, so it takes um, access as a ton of memory anyway. Um, so here we have the accuracy against training time, uh, with the circles this time being proportional to the computational complexity. So as expected, within the architectures, uh, we see the larger and more complex networks having a greater training time. And actually, if we just look up um, at the networks in the top of the graph, um, so ignore VGG for a moment, um, we start to see a general trend of increased accuracy with those longer training times. And then here we have mean per class average versus classification speed of the different architectures. So this is on the unseen test data. Classification speed is the number of images an architecture can classify per second at a certain batch size. When we look at the individual architectures, so within ResNet, DenseNet, and VGG networks, we start to see a sort of general trade-off existing between faster classification and higher recognition performance. But what's really interesting Minutes. here, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, what's really interesting here is that Inception, which we know has one of the highest accuracies on this data set, is actually showing a classification speed, which is almost nearly double that of the other highest accuracy, which was DenseNet 169. So if we were to choose Inception over DenseNet, for a 0.08% decrease in accuracy, we can classify 438 more images per second. Um, beyond accuracy, there are some evaluation metrics we need to be aware of when describing performance algorithms. So these are precision and recall. If you're not familiar with them, precision is basically the percentage of your results that are relevant to the question, and recall or sensitivity is the percentage of the res relevant results that are correctly classified. I know that probably sounds a bit blurry, but basically if these numbers are higher, the results are better. So what we can see here is that Inception is fairly consistent in outperforming the other networks. So that's the yellow bar. Um, you know, it's not always got the best values, but it's always generally up there in the top three for all. So to conclude, when considering all evaluation metrics presented today, we find the Inception v3 architecture to be the most suitable for textual carbonate core classification. Um, so I've just got a normalized confusion matrix for Inception here. If you've not seen a confusion matrix before, it's probably a tad confusing, um, but basically we use it to describe the performance of our classification model. So the diagonal cells um, are associated to the observations that are correctly classified, and the off-diagonal cells correspond to the incorrectly classified observations. So we can see that some of the main areas for misclassification are between boundstone and redstone, oh, sorry, got off the slide, uh, boundstone and redstone, floatstone and redstone, mudstone and waxstone, and packstone and waxstone. So this suggests that these er errors are occurring between fascias that are adjacent in the modified Dunham classification and are therefore similar to errors a geologist can make. This is likely related to interpreter bias, so this is something we're addressing with our citizen science project, What's Your Reef, which we hope to launch later this year. Thank you for your time, um, and yeah, thanks to IDP for the images. Fantastic, thank you very much. Okay, right, the chat is now open, so uh, if anybody any questions for Harriet, please uh, post them in there. Um, you pretty much got to the question I was going to ask at the end, really, is, is how much of, when you're training these images, is how much error is there in the uh, geologist classification initially um, that you're training the data set with? And did you, when you made those classifications for your training data set, did you, did you run them past a number of people, or was it you that decided what were the mudstone and waxstone and packstone, for example? Uh, yes, yeah, so um, so this kind of preliminary data set that we've done uh, this training on is based on um, so the IODP classifications um, from the shipboard, um, as well as my own, so it's kind of a combination of those. Um, but obviously that does introduce some bias and we really want to try and reduce that as much as possible. Um, so that's why we're re um, releasing our citizen science project. Um, so that's gonna be on a platform called Zooniverse. I'm not sure if you've heard of that. Um, it's basically got lots of different projects on there. It's really exciting, even NASA are on there. So if you want to go and help the AI for the Mars mission, I don't know why I'm promoting other um, ones, do mine, but yeah, um, yeah. it's a really good um, thing and um, it helps get other people involved. So it's great for outreach. Um, but also it helps reduce the bias. So each individual image is classified by five different people. So um, it really will help expand the data set as well. Thank you very much. Um, okay, we've not got much coming through in the chat actually, apart from, from Sanjay. Sanjay says an excellent presentation. So thank you very much for that. Um, anybody 
Mm -hmm. I have a quick question. Yeah. yeah. Nobody won. <laughs> Nobody has one. Okay. So, um, yeah, great talk, Harriet. Um, so I, I could see that you you have quite a uh, big data set, like hundred thousand something, right? So do you think is it worth to spend time building your own uh, architecture or model, just to to have you, like you know instead of doing transfer learning? Uh, yeah. So um, that is something that we're considering. Um, originally we weren't sure how large a data set we could get. So we kind of um, chosen transfer learning to be the best option. Um, we are kind of approaching more of a number where we could potentially make our own. Um, we have done a comparison. Um, so for this, as well as the large data set, we've done it two different other magnitudes. So we've got um, a 48,000 image data set and a 7,000 image data set to see how these architectures um, compare um, between the different sizes. Um, obviously, the idea of using transfer learning is that um, if you have a smaller data set, it shouldn't make that much difference. But actually, we do still see some um, overfitting in the lower um, data set. Um, but yeah, I think we do want to um, maybe see if we can try and build our own architecture as well. Um, as scary as that may be. <laughs> yeah, cool. um, Thank you. Okay, they're, they're, they're streaming in now. So, Cole McCormick, there's um, evidently one of the challenges here, as with many things in Carbonates, is the issue of scale. Work is based on core images. But how do you know that? Uh, sorry, how do you think this can be downscaled to microfaches and thin section or upscaled to larger allochems that may be bigger than the core diameter, such as corals and stromatophoroids? Uh, yeah, so that's something um, we're working on. So, um, kind of the end goal is to create like a, a, a big system that will be able to do core and thin section images. Um, so for thin sections, it does need to be um, a different algorithm. I know Ardi has done a lot of work with segmentation um, uh, for uh, thin section images, um, which is really cool. Great paper. Um, you should read that one if you haven't. Um, but um, yeah, we um, have tested um, the uh, this algorithm on um, slightly different size images. Um, it works okay for the original Dunham classification scheme, but obviously when you include the modifications by Embry and Cloven, um, that's a lot more dependent on you know, that two millimeter size difference. Um, and so we need to, when we do that, we need to be able to factor in a way to measure. Um, um, so I guess put in the pixels and the scale, and then the, the algorithm can work out actually what size it's dealing with. So it knows it from there. Um, so that's kind of something we'll work on at the moment is the scalability of this. Um, so yeah, it's ongoing. Thank you. Um, right, comment from Stephen. Excellent presentation. I could see this working in pure carbonates, but what about mixed carbonate, plastic, or even carbonate to uh, Yeah, so, um, so yeah, so my work's kind of focused on the pure carbonates. Um, we do actually, in the research group, have a student starting later this year who'll be working on plastics. Um, so hopefully, once he gets started, we'll be able to kind of um, combine our work there and try and create, um, I guess, a dual system um, throughout there. So it's a lot of possibilities, which is really exciting to see um, where it can go. Thank you. And um, I guess probably the last one we've got time for anyway, um, Peter Burgess, really interesting talk, thank you. Um, based on what I understood, you said it, it's possible to extract an optimum number of layers from the neural network for the most general application. Can you explain a bit more about how that works and if I've understood correctly? Yeah, of course. Um, so basically, if, actually, if I go back, hang on. Is that gonna, yeah. If I go back to the slide, which is kind of a general uh, structure of a network. Um, so basically this kind of, um, this top one would be the pre-trained model that we use. So this, the base convolutional network, um, it contains, it's able to extract features from images. So that could be like, um, like edge detection filters and stuff like that. So you can see um, it can extract different features from them that it uses to identify the images. Um, the second bit of it, so that's this bit in green over here, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, that's called the classification head. So that's the bit where um, once the images have passed through all of these convolutional filters, it then goes to the classification and it's um, passed through all these labels and it's learned what it is. Um, so when we transfer it to our own, we can use those generic features um, from that bottom convolutional network, so the base model, and we just remove the classifier top and we put our own classifier head on it. Um, we then went further and did a fine tuning step um, to improve the accuracy. Um, you do need to be aware when you, if you do do fine tuning, if you want to use one of these networks, is that it can be very prone to overfitting very quickly. Um, so you need to use a much lower learning rate um, and you need to monitor it a lot. Um, but 
um, I think I, I think I said in the presentation, the for the the lower layers in the network, um, a very very generic image features, and as you go further deeper into the network, it becomes a lot more specific to those images. So we can um, unfreeze some of those upper most layers. Um, so just, just a couple of the top ones, um, and we can retrain those on our images as well. And um, so it's more detecting features in our images rather than those you know, golden retrievers and toilet papers kind of things. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we're going to have to stop there because we would run a little bit over time. But um, yeah, thank you um, to everybody in that session. That was very short, but uh, very different and uh, exciting session. So uh, really appreciate you uh, putting the time in to present those. Thank you. Um,